the voice, it was just wrong. Like, it sounded like my mother's, but it was missing something that I couldn't put my finger on. Derek's face was stony and etched with rage as he sat in the dark cab staring at my house. And this scream awakened that horrible fear. The one that says, this can't really be happening to me, can it? Headphones recommended. Listener discretion advised. Welcome back in, everyone. I'm your host, Chad. You're just moments away from true tales of terror that will leave you breathless. This is Disturbed. This episode is sponsored by Wondery's Generation Y podcast, where hosts and true crime fanatics Justin and Aaron explore hundreds of unsolved murders and conspiracy theories. If you're ready to kick your true crime obsession into overdrive, subscribe to Wondery's The Generation Y podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or listen ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. And we're back at it again. One quick thing. We just dropped a brand new bonus episode on Patreon. Real disturbing 911 calls that you won't believe. So go get your access at disturbedpodcast.com support. Now let's get into it. In our first experience brought to us by Reddit user Meows and Boo, we discover why you can't always trust what you hear. Performing this experience is Matt Bradford, So, this story happened about 11 years ago. I was a senior in high school at the time, but it is the single most mind-boggling thing I've ever experienced. It's also important to note that it happened in mid-December. I'm from Iowa, and the winters here get cold at night. Like, if you get stuck outside, you will die kind of cold. That, plus the snowfall, makes everything dead silent. You can hear anything and everything inside the house, and even immediately outside of it. Well, me and my best friend were hanging out in my family's walkout basement, just having a boring winter night playing video games. We were also the only ones home. The reason it was just us is because my mother went from work straight to a bar to grab a few drinks with co-workers. So me and my friend thought it would be a good idea to break into the family wine and live a little. As we were sitting there opening up the first bottle, I hear the door to the garage open and slam shut. I immediately go, oh shit, and start looking for places to hide the bottle. My friend then says, I thought you said your mom was supposed to be out all night. She was, I replied. I then heard a few heavy stomps and my mother yell out, Meow Zimbu, anyone home? I yell back up the stairs, yep, just hanging out in the basement. I hear a few more steps move from the garage door towards the stairs and she yells out again. Can you come help me with something? I need you up here. I reply back while frantically trying to find a good place to hide the wine bottle. Yep, just uh, give me a minute. Then there was silence for about 20 seconds. Anyone down there with you? She yelled back in a more concerned, serious tone, in a voice that was slightly off of my mother's. This was the first thing that told me something wasn't right. Our family never cared if anyone was over, as our house was a very open house to all family and friends. And the voice... It was just wrong. Like, it sounded like my mother's, but it was missing something that I couldn't put my finger on. Weirded out, I just replied back, Just Colton. After I yelled that back to her, I found a good place to hide the bottle and began walking up the steps to the next level. Now, as I was walking up the stairs, I couldn't help but feel the overbearing silence of the house and the slight electric twinge that something isn't right. When I got to the top of the steps, I looked over to where the door to the garage is, and also the kitchen right next to it, and it was black, pitch black. All of the lights were off, and there was no moonlight shining through any windows. 
I walked over to the kitchen, yelling out, Mom, where are you? There was no reply, just silence and darkness. I felt the electric twinge turn into full needles, and my adrenaline kicking in full force. I have to get out of here as fast as possible. My mother was not home. I run back down the stairs, grabbing my coat along the way. What's wrong? Colton says. My mom's not home. I reply as fast as I can, looking for my truck keys. What do you mean? You were just talking with her. I could see the confusion in his face. Dude, there's no one home. We need to leave now. I took a few steps towards the back door that opens up to the yard, and then I see my dog shaking on the couch and my cat growling behind it. I couldn't leave them. I just knew that if we left, something would happen. Are we leaving? Colton said, still confused as hell. No, I, I can't leave them here alone. Something is really off. I'm going to call my mom and figure this out. I pull up my phone and called my mom. She picked up immediately. Yes, and Boo? What's going on? She answers. Hey, mom, were you just home? I heard you yelling from the second level, and when I went up, you weren't there. I said frantically, hoping that she was playing a joke. No, I'm just leaving the bar. I wasn't feeling very well. Are you okay? What do you mean you heard me? I filled her in on the whole story and she rushed home. Colton and I stayed in the basement with the animals until she got home. But before she did, you could hear something upstairs. Not walking or sitting on things, but a pressure in the air. Like a black hole was slowly moving from one room to the next. And the word that I would instinctively describe it as is hungry. When she got home, you could feel the thing leave just as quickly as it came. Like an overbearing predatory presence had just flown away. And we still have never figured out what the hell was going on. And this is just one story of many unexplainable things that have happened to us. But this is the easiest to write down. And the one I was happiest to have a witness. My mother has passed away now. And I have moved to Arizona. But whenever I go back to Iowa and I see Colton, he still gets creeped out by what had happened. I will never truly know what happened, but I know that whatever it was, it had my mother's voice. It was evil. And it was hungry. In Wondery's Generation Y podcast, hosts and true crime fanatics Justin and Aaron explore hundreds of unsolved murders and conspiracy theories. They dig through the evidence, give their perspective, and bring the hard questions. No case too big or too small, whether it's the Golden State Killer or a small town story. Take for instance the case of Linda Sturmer, which is the episode I just listened to. In 2007, a fire broke out at the family home and Linda's husband Todd was found dead on the lawn. Justin and Aaron take you through the entire case point by point, breaking it down in an easy to understand style, which is why I love the show so much. And get this, if you take a quick scroll through the Generation Y feed, you'll see over 400 episodes just waiting to be heard. That's why I subscribed and you should too. If you're ready to kick your true crime obsession into overdrive, subscribe to Wondery's The Generation Y Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or listen ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. Wondery, feel the story. Next up, a Tinder experience from Reddit user Yeastcrease that she won't be forgetting anytime soon. Performing this experience is Aaron Lillis. Three years ago, I tried Tinder for the first time. I was 25 at the time, and while most 25-year-old women have dabbled on Tinder or the like, I hadn't been single since I was 17. I met my ex while I was in high school. Six years later, we got married, had a baby. I was happy. But those last couple of years together, he had really begun to resent me and the family we had created together. I fought to keep our relationship together, but the abuse became more frequent and more intense. It got to the point where I took our baby and fled the house in the middle of the night. My mind was scarred and my heart was raw. It was a really difficult time in my life. A couple of months after I left, I had a new home, a new job, and a renewed sense of life. I was starting to open up and could feel myself healing. I was, however, lonely. I was adjusting to shared custody and spent my weekends alone. 
I didn't want to jump into a relationship, but I did want to experience some of the things my eight-year relationship hadn't allowed me. Joining Tinder felt fun. It was new and scary, and after so much trauma, it felt nice to have so much positive attention. My self-worth was low, so the cheap compliments and instant gratification of the app felt incredible. Who am I to deserve their attention? Why would they choose to speak to me of all women? Not my healthiest coping mechanism, but I wanted to feel desirable. That's when I met Derek. Derek was an unassuming, average guy. He was cute enough, but not so attractive that I felt self-conscious. Derek and I shared a few interests, craft beer, hiking, and he had a sense of humor that I liked. We agreed to meet up at a local restaurant. I was so nervous. My first date in eight years. I donned my cutest dress, got made up, and headed out. As I waited in the restaurant, my palms were sweaty, my heart was fluttering, and I began to question myself. He arrived and everything was awkward at first. We ordered our first beers and started to break the ice. As soon as the buzz of the alcohol began to hit, our conversation took off. We had relaxed in each other's company and the rest of the date went smoothly. We joked about karaoke across town. He laughed about how he didn't like karaoke. I am a huge fan of karaoke. While no superstar, I have spent a good amount of time in choirs and can carry a tune well enough. One of my favorite rowdy weekend activities is going to that bar and busting out some songs with the sweet taste of gin on my tongue. I convinced him to go with me and we left the restaurant. We sang into the night, taking shots, flirting, laughing. We ended the night in his truck, clumsily fumbling with each other's buttons and zippers, hearts racing with excitement. This had been what I needed. We texted back and forth more often, and soon we were talking about another date. I had enjoyed our time together and liked that I didn't feel a deep connection with him. It was fun, and that was it. Because my heart wasn't tangled up in feelings, he felt safe. We decided for our second date that we would go tubing down a river that runs through our town. We had parked his orange truck at the end of the tubing run and took the tubes in my truck upriver. We agreed that he would zip my truck key with his into a pocket on his shorts and that he would drop me off at my truck afterwards. Bright summer heat warmed our skin and the water felt crisp and fresh on our toes. The afternoon slipped past as we floated down the river. When we reached the bottom, we deflated our tubes and headed back to my truck. Only when Derek reached into his pocket, his face sank. He looked at me and said, your key is gone. I laughed, surely he was joking. He insisted this wasn't a joke. Gravity pulled at my stomach and I began to panic. This was the only copy of my truck key and I had taken it on the river. I felt foolish and worried about how I would get a new key if we couldn't find it. The river was long, we had been tubing for hours. We'd stopped at several places to swim. He offered to drive me home and I accepted. During the drive, we made a plan to meet up the next day to search for my key at some of the stops we had made. We spent the next afternoon combing our swimming holes for my key. Up and down, we swam with very little hope that we would ever see my keys. We had to try, though, and we kept at it. From one spot to another, we drove, we swam, and we moved on. At the very last place we checked, as the light of afternoon faded into a hazy orange, something caught his eye. Underwater, near the shore, were my keys. We were elated and could not believe our luck. To celebrate, we went back to his place for some drinks. He drove me down a long wooded driveway and at the very end was a shaded trailer. He told me that he was only renting a room here from an elderly couple, but they were on vacation so we would be alone. We walked over the creaking porch and entered the trailer. Inside, I could see the kitchen was messy. Not just a couple of dishes, but every surface was covered with mess. He ushered me away to show me his room. It was small and not very clean either. Dirty clothes, mattress on the floor, a Rubbermaid bin with some snacks like Doritos, and cheap, warm beer. We had sex. The yellowed light of the trailer accentuating the stains on the walls. Afterwards, the spark of fun I had felt when we first met had withered, and I felt gross. I decided that it would be our last date. A week passed and we hardly texted. Our brief fling was ending and I didn't expect to see him again. My mind moved on to other things. The coming weekend, my friends were coming to town and I was excited. We made plans to go to karaoke together on Saturday night. When the day arrived, I was surprised to see a text from Derek on my phone. Are you going to karaoke tonight? It read. I responded that I was and he texted back that he would be there. 
I thought you didn't like karaoke, I asked him, and he said that he had been invited by a girl he worked with and thought he should give me a heads up that he would be there with a date in case I was there. I thanked him for taking the time to let me know, reassured him that I wouldn't be bothered at all, and said that I hoped he had a great date. Around 9.30 that night, my friends and I arrived at the bar. The dim lights and reflective foil stars an all-too-familiar scene. We got our drinks and picked a booth with a good view of the stage. I had a strange sensation, like someone was watching me. I turned my head, scanning the bar, and our eyes locked. Derek and his date were a few booths away and he was watching us. He waved zealously with a big smile. His date turned around to look and I managed an awkward wave. I was absolutely fine with him being on a date, but I didn't want to advertise that we knew each other or make his date uncomfortable. My friends were all aware of the time we had spent together, my thoughts on the experience, and the texts he had sent me earlier. We were all thinking it was a bit odd that he would go out of his way to interact with me in front of his date, but no harm, no foul, he was just being friendly. The evening carried on, and we all had a great time basking in the atmosphere, drinking in the songs, and laughter. A couple of hours in, we were sitting in our booth when Derek stumbled over to our table with his date. He introduced her as Kate and plopped down beside me, pulling her down into our booth next to him. The strong smell of alcohol oozed off of them, and I could see they were hammered. It became obvious that they had both had too much to drink. Their eyes glazed and words slurred. Kate seemed really nice, despite her state, and she launched into a drunk story to the whole table. My friends and I were fairly uncomfortable and were unsure what was going on. Under the table, I felt Derek's sticky hand slide onto my thigh. His date was right there, and I was stunned. Without making a scene, I suddenly removed his hand and excused myself to get another drink. As I walked across the room, I could feel his eyes raking my back, and sure enough, when I turned around, he was watching. When I got back, Kate was slurring that her taxi had come. She and Derek exchanged a sloppy kiss and good nights, and then it was just us and Derek. Derek's mood shifted after that. He was drunkenly unaware of how uncomfortable the table was, and we could tell he was brooding about his date having left without him. Derek turned his attention to me. He slung his heavy arm over my shoulder and leaned in, his sour breath managing to come together to form clumsy sentences. You're so cute. I love your laugh. I was rigid and I just wanted him to leave. When he got up to get another beer, my friends and I spoke about the situation, one of them remarking, you know you can do better than this, right? I said that yes, as casual as this had been, I had made a mistake. We came to the conclusion it would be best if we ended the night early, as we didn't see him leaving me alone. As a backup plan, if anything went south, we agreed that the girls would go to the bathroom and leave out the back door, while our male friend would distract him and slip away. Derek arrived back at the table, sloshing his beer onto his front. He slurred, Where are we going next? I hesitated, but my friend told him that we would all be going home. Derek said he would walk us there, and we politely declined. He was leaning up against a wall and barely holding himself up at this point. We asked him how he was going to get home, and if we could call him a cab. Derek drunkenly pouted that he could just come to my place with me. Trying to shut him down as politely as I could, I told him that my child was there with a sitter so I couldn't have him over. He didn't need to know that wasn't true. He refused a taxi and said he would just sleep in his truck. Since his eyelids were drooping and looking at the rest of his state, it seemed reasonable that he would be able to fall asleep in his truck, and we accepted that answer. As we started to leave, he stumbled after us. We stopped and reminded him that we were going to bed. He argued again that he should come with me. My friends and I locked eyes. It was time to engage with our backup plan. The two girls and I excused ourselves to the washroom while our friend distracted him. Slipping out the back door, the cool rush of night air hit us and we hurried to the path that led to their hotel. Our friend caught up with us and said he had left Derek behind at the bar. We were all relieved to be out of there and started to walk back to their hotel. One of the girls was sober and offered to drive me home when we got to the hotel and I accepted. A few minutes down the path, my phone began to ring. I looked at the caller ID and felt my stomach drop. It was Derek. I turned the volume down and let it ring, and to my surprise, he left a voicemail. I turned on the speaker and played it out loud. Derek's voice sounded confused as his words melted together into the phone. Where are you guys? I thought we were gonna hang out. I don't understand. 
We were all glad we had left and agreed that this had been wild. That's when the phone rang again. Another voicemail popped up on my screen. In the dim light of the trail, I played the new voicemail aloud once more. His drunken speech was more intense this time as he launched into how he didn't understand why I had left. I had hurt his feelings and he was in love with me. The tone of his voice shook me when I heard him say, I love you. There was something dark and heavy about it that left me feeling unsettled. We were all creeped out, but happy to see the bright sign of the hotel ahead. We traveled the carpeted hallway to their room so my friend could grab her keys to take me home. As we entered the room, my phone began to ring again. This time, the voicemail sent shockwaves of fear through my body. Derek's voice had taken on an edge as he repeated that he loved me, but he was actually really fucking mad at me for leaving him at the bar. He went on about how could I do that to him. He didn't know what he was going to do. His voice shook with anger as he stumbled over himself expressing how I had betrayed him. The last thing he said before hanging up echoed in the hotel room. You know, I'm really starting to fucking hate you. This guy was unhinged and I was terrified. I was grateful this side of Derek hadn't shown up when we were alone in his secluded trailer. My friends gave me a hug and told me to call them if I needed anything and to keep them updated. My friend took me home, and as I unlocked the door and stepped into the comfort of home, I felt exhausted. It had not been the night out I expected, and Derek's erratic behavior had really freaked me out. Fresh out of an abusive relationship, his actions at the bar, then the voicemails, rang some all-too-familiar bells. That's when I saw the headlights. It was very late for anyone to be driving down my street. I peeked through the curtain. My blood ran cold and I trembled. Sitting in the cab of his orange truck was Derek. Mind racing, I panicked. This dude could barely hold himself up when we left. He was blackout obliterated. How did he drive across town to my house? How did he find me? I immediately remembered the other week when he dropped me off after my key was lost. How could I have been so stupid? I barely knew him. We had only met three times. Derek's face was stony and etched with rage as he sat in the dark cab staring at my house. He wasn't getting out. He was just staring while I was on my hands and knees peeking out the window. All the lights were off inside. I was sure he couldn't see me. Then the screen on my phone lit up. He was calling me again. I quickly hid it so he wouldn't see the light. Hands shaking, I played the voicemail as quietly as I could. Derek only said one thing this time, a phrase that sent terror shooting down my spine. In a drunken sing-song voice, almost taunting me, he quietly said, Where are you? Click. I was terrified. Somehow, I hadn't really considered I could be in danger and chalked up all the fear to my past experiences. Surely I was overreacting and it was my fault for reading too much into this. I shouldn't be this scared and I don't want to make a scene. That last voicemail sealed the deal. I figured even if I was overreacting, at the very least, he was a drunk driver. I called 911 and the dispatcher said someone would be there in a couple of minutes. As I peeked out the window, I saw him get out of his truck. He was done waiting. His heavy feet stumbled as they hit the pavement and he looked around. Derek's voice cut through the night. He started yelling my name. The wild anger in his voice was tangible through the walls, and he just yelled into the street. Where are you? Derek started to stumble towards my house when the flashing red and blue lights cascaded down the street, lighting up his face and highlighting every ounce of rage carved into his features. Two police cars pulled up, and the officers got out. I was still peeking out from inside my dark house, and couldn't hear much of what was happening. I watched them breathalyze him, which he obviously failed. The officers inspected his truck. They all spoke for a while, and one of the officers came to my door. I spoke to him about what had happened, and he was very empathetic. He said as unsettling as his actions had been, there wasn't much they could do without a direct threat. The officer let me know that they would be taking him in for the night and he would be charged with drunk driving, but that he would be out tomorrow and to make sure I kept my doors locked and stayed safe. The tow truck came to remove his orange truck from the road and I could see him arguing. The officers weren't having any of it and they turned him around to cuff him. As the handcuffs locked around his wrist, he yelled out one last time, looking directly at the window I was peeking out. I know you're in there. Why don't you come out to say goodnight? 
As quickly as my street had filled up, it was empty. The quiet shadows of late night swallowing the earlier chaos into nothingness. Derek texted me the next afternoon. I'm very sorry about last night. I was in a bad place. I responded that his actions were unacceptable and how dare he show up at the house my child lives at and that I would prefer not to hear from him again. He apologized one last time and I haven't heard from him since. Over the next few months, I would see him on a bike going to and from his workplace, so I know he lost his license. I was always wary that we would bump into each other, which thankfully never happened. I can only imagine how much angrier he was after that night lost him his license. I found out that he moved to the mainland a while back, which was quite a relief for me, and I no longer feel as on edge around town. So, Derek, let's never meet again. And finally, our title story coming from Reddit user Great Buildings. It's when you least expect it that you'll hear the blood curdling scream. And join me in welcoming our newest guest narrator to the show, the host of Podcast Magazine's Hot 50 Countdown, Rob Actis. It was Christmas time. My wife and I were staying at her childhood home where her mother now lived all alone. Well, not if you include the cats. Meow. The house was on a quiet cul-de-sac in the suburbs. If you're picturing freshly mowed lawns, American flags, and empty sidewalks, you're picturing it right. It's a single-story home with an attached garage out front. The garage has two doorways. Apart from the electric garage door, of course. One leads to the garden and backyard. This had an old doggy door from their days with dear old Max. R.I.P. Max. That they covered with a piece of nailed-in wood. That had always made me slightly uncomfortable before. But I figured it had been that way for years, so what's the worst that could happen? The second door leads to the kitchen. Hollow core. It could stop a mouse, but not much else. Definitely not something that wanted in, or someone. We were asleep in my wife's childhood bedroom at the front of the house. 3 a.m. I was in that deep, dark recess of sleep. You know, you're in the diving bell and you're submerged hundreds of meters below the surface in black water, protected from the real world by miles of nothingness. Then I heard it, the scream. What are you doing? It was my mother-in-law's voice echoing down the hallway. To me, lost in a sea of sleep, it sounded like a jet engine roaring past my eardrum. I bolted up. What happened next happened in a matter of seconds. But about that scream, even though I was dead asleep, I heard enough of it to sense an urgency behind it. This wasn't a, oh, you scared me, type of scream. This was different. And I knew it. Not consciously. But my lizard brain, that piece we retained from our primitive ancestors, knew something was wrong. I watch and read a fair amount of true crime, and this scream awakened that horrible fear. The one that says, This can't really be happening to me, can it? Honestly, in that second of the night, it sounded like someone was about to be murdered. You ever wonder if you're a fight or flight type of individual? I always have. And I came to know something about myself after this night. I'm a fighter. I leaped out of bed, growled, yes, growled, in the manliest voice I could muster. I'm gonna kill you, motherfucker! And took off running. I tore open the bedroom door and ran into the hallway. There at the end, I saw my mother-in-law, nightgown on, look of utter shock on her face standing still. We make eye contact as I continue toward her. Then she turns her head, looks directly into the kitchen. I hurry past her and round the corner into the kitchen. The holocore door is obliterated, shards everywhere. I look through the open frame and see the electric garage door is open. I push ahead. As I run into the garage, I hear it. The sound of someone hopping into a running car just out of view. 
Just as I make it onto the driveway, I see a car peeling out from the sidewalk adjacent to the house. But the adrenaline is still pumping. And who am I to say no to adrenaline? So, like an idiot, I run. Barefoot. After the car. I give a good go, but I'm no Michael Johnson, and even he couldn't catch a speeding car. It soon vanishes down the street, and I'm left all alone. The police showed up within three minutes, which, I have to say, makes me feel a lot more at ease with my mother-in-law living there. They took our statements. My mother-in-law said she heard a noise, the hollow core door being kicked in, and walked into the kitchen where she encountered the burglar, a small framed woman. The police theorized she was working as part of a team. Her job was to squeeze through the doggy door and open the electric garage door for her accomplice. According to the police, the burglars most likely thought nobody was home. Fortunately, my mother-in-law must have caught her off guard and scared her. In addition to my manly growl, of course. But it feels good to know that everyone was safe. And to learn that I guess I've got a little fight in me. And, for the record, we bought the heaviest goddamn wooden door you've ever seen to replace that hollow core. I'd like to see a mouse try and get through that. And as we do before we go, let's take a listener voicemail off the horror hotline. 701-354-3667. Hey, I'm a truck driver from Red Deer, and I just wanted to say you got the best horror stories I've heard so far on the Spotify podcast, and they're really cool to listen to because I'm on the road pretty much every day doing 14 hour trips so it's really nice to have something to listen to while i'm trucking down the road thank you keep it up bye thanks for the message and let's give a shout out to all our listeners out there on the road nothing like some true scary stories to help out with that windshield time disturbed is a disturbed media original podcast musical score by white bat audio co.ag I'm Kevin Hartnell. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next Thursday with a brand new episode. And stay safe out there, y'all.